Hello everyone and welcome to the Game Engine programming series where we write a game engine from scratch. Previously we wrote our very first compute shader for Primal Engine, which will be used to compute a grid of frustums for light culling. Today we are going to set up the data and the buffers that are needed and try to run this shader by calling the dispatch function. Before we start, I'd like to thank all my Patreon supporters who are always encouraging me to continue working on this series. And today my special thanks go to Von Bismarck and Falcon1911 who are supporting us at the highest tier. A big shout out to you both for joining our respectable tribal elders. Thank you so much for your support. Now that we have our grid frustums compute shader, we need to create buffers that hold the light calling data and attach those to the pipeline before dispatching the shaders. Therefore I'll add a new submodule to the low level renderer for light calling using a new namespace. Because we are removing lights that are not affecting any object, we are delighting our scene. Hence the namespace delight. Here we define the light culling tile size, and similar to other submodules, we also add initialize and shutdown functions. The important function here is call lights, which takes a command list pointer and references to D3D12 frame info and resource barriers. We have to forward declare D3D12 frame info, and then we can implement these functions in D3D12 lightcalling.cpp file. Let me try and build the project first and fix a typo. Okay, for initialization, we need to call two functions that create root signatures and pipeline state objects for grid frustums compute shader as well as the light calling shader, which we'll write in the next episode. First, let me add all header files that I think we'll need. Next, we need to define our root parameters. Here, I'll use an enumeration again, similar to those for GPASS and post process steps. As you can see, we need three items for grid frustums compute shader. Namely the global shader data, shader dispatch parameters, which will pass in a constant buffer, and the buffer that contains the array of frustums. As we'll see later, we use the same slot in the root signature for a global index counter during light calling. So it's either attached as an unordered access view for the frustum buffer that's written to by the grid frustums compute shader, or a UAV for the index counter which is used in the light calling shader. We can use the same root signature for both grid frustums and light calling compute shaders, so we need just one pointer. However, we do need two different pipeline state objects. I'll add the pipeline state object pointer for the grid frustums first. So the initialization will succeed if we manage to create the root signature, the pipeline state object, and we initialize the light module. This is already being done in core.cpp. So let's replace that with the initialization from delight. Okay, I'll stop. Why, it's a good song. Anyway, we call delight initialize and shutdown functions. 
While we are here, let's also add a call to call lights after updating light buffers. This is why I like this renderer, by the way. If you want to add something, you just call a function. Okay, let's go back and write our functions. In create root signatures, we check that our pointer is not initialized yet, and then we use the root parameter helper structure to define an array of root parameters. The first one is the constant buffer for global shader data. There is no visibility flag for compute shaders specifically, so we need to set its visibility to all. I guess this is because the compute pipeline has a single stage, which is the compute shader stage, so that is technically all stages. The next constant buffer is the one that contains the shader parameters, and we have the frustum output buffer, which is attached as an unordered access view. We need to be careful with register numbers. They must correspond to the ones in the shader code. Now we can use these parameters and create a root signature, again using our helper structure. Then we give it a debug name and return the pointer. We have to create the pipeline state object next. Here we need a stream of pipeline state subobjects, which in this case is just two items the root signature and the compute shader. Hmm. Uh, well, it's a bit unfortunate that there is another header file with the same name. Okay, now we can get the grid frustums compute shader. We call create pipeline state helper function with this stream to create a PSO give it a name and return it. That is all that we need to initialize this submodule. In order to shut it down, we call shutdown for lights and defer release the root signature and the PSO. When I run the application, we see that we successfully created the PSO and the root signature. Before we write the calling function, we need a structure that can hold the data that we need for every frame and per render surface. Since we can have multiple windows open with different dimensions, we need to have a frustum buffer for each one of them. Of course, we could reuse a single buffer for all surfaces, but that would mean that we need to recalculate each buffer for every frame. So here we have a calling parameters structure, which has a D3D12 buffer for the frustums array. It also has the dispatch parameters, frustum count, view dimensions, and camera's field of view, since this also determines how frustums are calculated. Because we are using multiple frame buffers for rendering, we need as many of these as the number of frame buffers. So we can define another struct that just contains an array of calling parameters. Finally, we can put the light colors for each surface in a free list. Now every time we create a D3D12 surface, we'll add a color to this list. When a D3D12 surface is removed, it also removes the color that it owns. Therefore, we need two functions in order to add and remove colors. And they are both really simple functions. 
Next, we add a new member field in the 3D12 surface class, which holds the light calling ID. As noted here, we must not forget to update all functions that copy and move the data. I'll also make all these functions no discard and add a new getter for the light calling ID. Now every time we create a swap chain, we add a color and when we remove a surface, we remove the color using the light calling ID. We need to pass this light calling ID in the frame info, so we can look up the right calling parameters for each surface. I guess I'll also initialize all these fields. And we can call the getter function to fill the calling ID in frame info. I'm also going to use the viewport width and height, which are already floating point values. We are now ready to write the calling function. First, we get a reference to the calling parameters using the caller ID and the frame index. If the surface width, height, or the camera's field of view are different from what we have in the calling parameters, that means that we need to resize our buffers if necessary and recalculate the grid frustums. Let's write a function that does just that. Because we don't call these functions every frame, it's better to tell the compiler not to inline it, so that we get better instruction cache coherency. The compiler might not have done it anyway, but now we can make sure that it doesn't. Further, this function takes the same parameters as before, with the addition of the calling parameters. Here we update the fields for this color, so they will be the same next time, unless something had changed. Then we resize the frustums buffer and recalculate. Let's add two new functions for this. In the resize function, we are going to determine how many frustums we need in order to cover the current screen space. To do this, we need to round up the screen dimensions to a multiple of tile size and then divide it by the tile size. This will give us the number of frustum rows and columns. The frustum count is simply the number of rows multiplied by the number of columns. Next, we need to set the dispatch parameters, which consists of the number of thread groups and the number of threads. <laughs> 
The number of threads is the same as the number of rows and columns, so that we have one thread that will calculate one frustum. We need to divide the threads in thread groups and dispatch enough thread groups to cover the screen. We can compute the number of thread groups by rounding up the number of threads by the tile size and divide by tile size again. This is how many thread groups we should dispatch. Note that we don't use the number of thread groups in the grid frustums compute shader, but we need it in the C side when we dispatch the shaders, as we'll see later in this video. Now that we calculated the dispatch parameters, we can resize the buffers. I'll write yet another function for this. Here we calculate the buffer size that is needed to hold this many frustums, and if the needed size is bigger than the current buffer size, we create a new buffer. We need to set the unordered access flag in order to make it possible for the compute shader to write to this buffer. If the buffer is not big enough, we create and assign a new D3D12 buffer to the frustums buffer. This will release the old buffer. Also note that the buffer is not CPU accessible, because it will be written to by the GPU and read from by the GPU. Finally, we need to dispatch our compute shader in calculate grid frustums function. First, we allocate a chunk from the global constant buffer and copy the dispatch parameters. Next, we transition the buffer resource to unordered access state, which makes it writable for the compute shader. Since we are going to run the shader next, we need to apply this barrier right here. Now we can set the root signature, the pipeline state, and the root parameters. We can get the GPU virtual address of global shader data from D3D12 info. The address for dispatch parameters is calculated by GPU address function. And we can directly pass the GPU address of the frustums buffer. As I mentioned before, we can use num thread groups to dispatch as many thread groups as needed. After the dispatch, we need to transition the buffer back to non-pixel shader resource. This is because we are going to read from the buffer in the next compute shader, which does the light calling. We'll write that compute shader in the next episode. Now we should be able to run our grid frustums calculation, at least in theory. In practice, however, it throws an exception, which means that we have some bugs to fix. You might already know what's causing this, and in that case, feel free to go ahead and run the application. As an exercise, you could also try to visualize the frustum plane normals in the post-processing step to check if the values make sense. If you don't feel like doing that all by yourself, don't worry, that's exactly what I'm going to show you in the next video. As always, thank you for joining me and I'll see you next time. Thanks for watching. If you like this video, please feel free to like and subscribe. If you join me on Patreon, you'll get access to the code on GitHub so you don't have to type everything over from the video. Plus there are also other nice goodies and rewards exclusive to my Patreon supporters. Please use the link in the video description to check them out. I hope to see you next time. Until then, take care and happy game engineering.